Uh, hello, everyone. Now let's uh, start the session two. Uh, so the there are um, two cases, the keynote speaker first, and uh, for each presentation is uh, 15 minutes, and uh, for the other presentation, uh, for each uh, each one is uh, 10 about uh, 10 minutes. Finally, we have a ha half an hour for discussion. Okay, now uh, let's uh, welcome to the first uh, keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Pretty uh, Parikh. Uh, from University College uh, London. Uh, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, let me share my slides. But whilst I'm sharing my slides, I want to uh, commend everyone, the UK and the China team, um, for organizing such a wonderful um, conference. It's been fascinating looking at uh, watching the presentations so far. Let me uh, just set it to presentation mode. OK, can everyone see my slides and hear me clearly? Yes, yes, yes it's very clear. Thank you. OK, well, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to be here. And I'm going to build on some of the discussions we've had earlier about um, water sanitation infrastructure, energy infrastructure, and making the case for why the role of infrastructure or why infrastructure is so important, has been so important, but even more important post pandemic, and why we need to try this or uh, consider sustainable development goals as an important framework for moving forward. So a bit of introduction about myself. Um, I, I'm an associate professor in the Bartlett um, Faculty of Built Environment at University College London, where I created this uh, novel center, Research Center Engineering for International Development. The center is exciting and unique because we always use mixed methods. Um, even though I'm a chartered civil engineer fellow institution of civil engineers in UK and also potentially a council member from November, um, I work with experts from other disciplines. So I work with geographers, experts in health, planning, uh, social scientists. So most of our work involves mixed methods and is interdisciplinary. And our mission is to address global challenges in resource challenge settings. So settings such as refugee camps, uh, high density settings like slums in low and middle income countries, but through providing infrastructure, uh, which is resilient and sustainable. Uh, we also have a portfolio of research looking at the links between built environment and health. We have developed the evidence base to say why is infrastructure investment and action so important for addressing sustainable development goals, which I'll talk about later today. And a lot of our infrastructure and development, we look at how gender inclusive those solutions are because women bear the burden or brunt of poor infrastructure. And we've been reflecting as a center on the impact of COVID-19 on initiatives around infrastructure. And when I say infrastructure, a lot of our work focuses on water and sanitation solutions in slums, but we also have a portfolio of research on clean cooking uh, solutions and solar energy solutions uh, with industry partners in China and in Sub-Saharan Africa. And the reason why I got into this field, and I think many of you will share my frustration. I mean, I grew up in India, and I know a lot of you would have uh, live in countries where technology is not a barrier. Um, a lot of our nations have made advances in space research, in science, in technology. Uh, so we know how to develop robust technical solutions, but yet we find that there are failures in systems. We find that there are a lot of people who are left behind uh, when it comes to mainstream infrastructure and development. And this really frustrates me and this really makes me sad. Um, which is why I created the research center that I have and which is why I've dedicated um, the last 25 years of my career to thinking about how to improve living conditions for people through engineering solutions. And what COVID has done is it has brought to the forefront existing vulnerabilities and challenges that our cities faced. It has brought to the forefront gaps in infrastructure services, gaps in health services, it has also brought to the forefront inequities, disparities, the divide in our cities um, between people who have access to um, clean kind of living environments and people who do not have access to those environments. And our research is showing that COVID is um, placing an added burden on those who already were challenged. 
So part of the post-pandemic recovery should be thinking about how to reduce those inequities. And what do people want and what do people desire? Um, many years ago, I was uh, interviewing respondents in living in slums in India and in the western part of India where I came from. And this graph here shows an average of responses from 100 residents. Um, the blue line shows the responses before we provided infrastructure. So when I say infrastructure, we provided water sanitation services, roads, rainwater drainage, in slum settlements in India. And before people had access to those basic services, their priority, their needs, aspirations was around infrastructure. The red line shows how the priorities shifted uh, after they received access to infrastructure services. And their aspirations and needs shifted to thinking about land ownership, improving housing stock, health, and education for children and employment. But what does this mean? This means that infrastructure can enable, can shift needs and aspirations from day-to-day -day survival and struggle to thinking about higher order needs and aspirations, to improving quality of life, to enable people to be more engaged citizens and think about the welfare of the children and future generation. So what infrastructure does is magical because it really unlocks uh, kind of that untapped potential in people by relieving them of day-to-day -day struggles. And we know globally and we know that infrastructure has a vital role to play. So for example, uh, safe water sanitation um, has been responsible uh, for kind of the highest reductions in mortality rates in Europe. I mean, I'm based in London and you can see examples of that in London through um, piped sewage networks and redevelopment of River Thames. And strangely enough, I mean, with, with uh, River Thames and if London did not have access to pipe network and infrastructure, this is how River Thames would look like. And as you can see, it presents a picture uh, which is quite shocking and comical in a way. Um, and this kind of visualization immediately shows that uh, for every city um, it is underpinned or it needs to be underpinned by robust infrastructure. Some of the solutions that I've been involved in in India involve thinking creatively about low cost and frugal solutions. Uh, because a lot of them were in uh, so-called settings of slums, informal settlements, which are very high densities. Densities were mentioned earlier and densities um, are inevitable in cities, but have an important role to play. And in those dense settlements, one can argue that it's actually cost effective per person, per household. It's cheaper to provide the infrastructure, but only if those infrastructure solutions account for those densities. And in a lot of those settlements, we looked at solutions which were network solutions, uh, solutions where we provided water sanitation roads, electricity, all in one shot, uh, but solutions which were shallow solutions because uh, one of the most expensive components of infrastructure would be the deep manholes. So looking at solutions which followed the lay of the land, so nature-friendly solutions, uh, looking at collecting high-quality topographical survey data to enable us to design those nature sensitive solutions resulted in um, kind of cost effective network solutions. It also enabled us to get over this poverty syndrome of, oh, we are dealing with poor people and hence the technical solutions needs to be poor. Uh, I would disagree and say if we are dealing with people in resource challenge settings and uh, the solutions have to be even better. Technically, we have to be even smarter than what we have been. And in my doctorate, and I'm not going to present all the results here, what I demonstrated is to those type of frugal infrastructure solutions, it helped to elevate poverty and improve health, education, income and housing in those communities. This is just a visualization of one of those communities. And infrastructure has a massive return on investment. Of course, it depends on how you estimate and look at it. But if you look at the multiplier effect or uh, return on investment, what infrastructure did in those communities in India is it, it increased uh, incomes. I look at it as disposable income monthly expenditure because it's very difficult to accurately estimate incomes in those settings because they are not fixed. Also, I looked at, uh, if you look at the uh, graph at the bottom, which the blue line shows the government investment in infrastructure, 
the yellow bar shows what the communities invested back in terms of improving their housing stock and contributing as partners to the cost of infrastructure. So we looked at new models uh, for developing infrastructure in communities. As a centre, we also look at energy systems and energy systems have a vital role to play in improving health and well-being in cities and especially a vital role to play in our post-pandemic recovery because if we want our vaccination programs to be successful, uh, we need access to uh, energy for refrigeration, for transportation, for the research which underpins uh, vaccines. We also need electricity to run our healthcare facilities, uh, especially those in very remote settings. So energy systems will have a vital role to play um, in the post-COVID recovery. And the map here shows a lack of access to energy in Sub-Saharan Africa. This is a, a view of Sub-Saharan Africa in the night time. Uh, one challenge we've found is kind of convincing and evidencing that infrastructure is very important. So I've been leading a portfolio of projects where we map out evidence, uh, published evidence, and this is uh, reviewing about 500, 600 publications in the field. And I was part of the energy and development group at UCL where we say, let's map out the evidence between all the 169 SDG targets and energy systems and see if we can evidence those synergies. What we found was that there were synergies between at least 143 out of the 169 targets. Uh, so 85% of the targets and all 17 goals so there's synergies, uh, there's a high level of synergy between energy systems, i.e. access to energy and the sustainable development goal. And what this shows is the benefit of infrastructure is not just about improving access to infrastructure, but it's wide ranging. It goes up and extends to sectors of education, nutrition, health, resource consumption, climate change. It's, it's overarching and it shows that energy is essential for well-being. Um, we also explored a similar evidence-based study looking at renewable energy, solar energy solutions in Rwanda. And we found that even for a specific renewable sol a solution like solar, um, there are synergies between solar energy access in Rwanda and about 85 of the SDG targets. So that's 50% of the targets just through uh, one renewable energy solution. And in the renewable energy space, which is, a, which is currently funded by a Royal Academy of Engineering Fellowship and Industry Partnership, I've been looking at how communities respond to access to clean energy. And we have this notion that we provide the technical solution and the communities will automatically take it and they will progress up this uh, clean energy ladder. And our notion is that through this, everyone will use clean energy and will stop the use of quality fuels. But in reality, in very remote villages, in poor communities, we're finding that's not the case. We find that people are stacking multiple energy sources. So at one point in time, they could be using their solar home systems, but they are also using lanterns. They could be using uh, LPG fuel for cooking, but they also are uh, looking to use charcoal or wood, which they can acquire for free. So they practice stacking and in reality, we have an energy staircase where people use multiple sources of fuel. So the behavioral aspect of this is what we're studying now in addition to the modeling aspect, because we're finding uh, that transitioning people to clean energy is more complicated than we thought it would be. Now with COVID, our worry, and we have early evidence, uh, which we will be publishing in a report next month, we are finding that with COVID, more and more houses due to loss of income are moving down this energy staircase, are moving down this pathway of clean transition. So they are moving away from use of clean fuels to accessing polluting fuels. In some instances, it is cheaper because they can get access to charcoal, which is uh, low cost or wood, which is free. But in some instances, it is not cheaper. But a lot of households are unable to keep up with monthly payments to access clean energy sources. So in our report, we are making recommendations on the types and natures of subsidy uh, that would need to be provided uh, both um, to the government agencies, but also to private sectors who operate in this uh, space, especially in Sub-Saharan um, Africa. Um, in addition to mapping out evidence links uh, between energy and SDGs, we carried out a similar exercise for sanitation 
where we mapped it under the domains of individual aspirations, environment, infrastructure services, and governance and partnerships. If you look at the middle bill diagram in green, we found uh, through a review of nearly 600 publications that there were synergies between sanitation and 130 out of the 169 targets. And this shows the wide ranging benefits once again of uh, sanitation infrastructure. And we found that there was overlaps with all 17 targets and a lot of benefits around protecting the environment, safeguarding ecosystems, supporting livelihoods, supporting climate action and reduction of disease. We found some trade-offs where uh, cost was seen to be a barrier in some instances. Sometimes there was mismatch in internal intent and in projects between international funders and donors and what the local community needs and aspirations were. We also found that sometimes uh, the mechanisms for government taxation were not well formed. So we also found some trade-offs, but overall we found that there were strong synergies between sanitation and the SDGs. And we found benefits across multiple levels. So we found that um, infrastructure such as energy and sanitation benefit individuals, households, communities, society, and the environment. And what this also shows is that there's a business case for governments to invest in infrastructure, not just the ministries for water and energy, but this would benefit ministries working in education and in health because the benefits of infrastructure are wide ranging. And as part of the COVID, uh, post pandemic COVID recovery, therefore my recommendation is that we continue and foster investment in infrastructure uh, and we continue monitoring evaluation through sustainable development goals. This is a piece of work we did in uh, Brazil where we evidence. Uh, sorry, there's some sorry. Um, I just heard some interruption in the background. Um, so this is a piece of work we did in Brazil uh, where we looked at uh, a true evidence once again how sanitation links to various sustainable development goals, but also the complex links that sanitation provided between various goals and targets uh, to build resilience, uh, to empower communities to reduce pollution and enhance well-being. So we live in this complex world, um, in a complex system, which is why engineers will need to work with social scientists, why we need this interdisciplinary approach where we need to pull our expertise to provide infrastructure uh, solutions which are acceptable. And the SDGs provide a wonderful framework for kind of monitoring and evaluation of those outputs. Some of us may disagree that the SDGs uh, have a global lens and sometimes they do not reflect the local challenges. But we are working with governments, for example, to help rationalization, prioritization, and localization of SDG targets. I also did a piece of study looking at the implication of lack of water sanitation facilities in uh, high density urban settings such as slums um, and the implications as a result of COVID-19. Now we talk about lockdowns and the fact that lockdown has been a blunt instrument so far to tackle the pandemic. But how is it possible to impose lockdown if people do not have access to water sanitation services in the households? Because they do have to go out of the house. They do have to then queue up at water collection points and public toilets. Um, and this uh, faces challenges around uh, social distancing, around introducing even more contact points, uh, which goes against uh, what we're trying to do in mitigating uh, the impact of COVID. So in this visualization, we show uh, how contact points, which are the red circles, are generated, additional contact points are generated because of poor access to infrastructure services. And I think the point of densities came up earlier and it is an important point because if we have cities with high densities, we need to think about ways of improving and designing infrastructure to make our cities COVID friendly or COVID safe um, and make sure we improve the living environment and conditions. And water sanitation services has a function in COVID recovery because it will help us to uh, combat the virus, to monitor water and sanitation services, to look at the traces of the virus. It will help to overall improve health. It will also help in um, gender, reducing gender inequity because it is women who often bear the burden of poor infrastructure. 
So as part of the post-pandemic recovery, I advocate that uh, water sanitation will have an important role to play. Uh, to conclude uh, my discussion, I hope this does um, spur further discussion is as part of post-pandemic recovery, we really need to harmonize investment, action, but also policies for infrastructure because um, the infrastructure benefits are not just confined to one ministries. Many ministries uh, could benefit uh, from improvement engineering solutions. And for this, we need interdisciplinary evidence base. So as academics, we need to get together from different disciplines and to look at the problem more holistically. We also need context specific uh, case studies, recognizing that the situation, say in Beijing, would be very different from the situation in London. So we need those context specific case studies and evidence base. And we need more integrated projects which look at an access approach. We also need cross-sectoral collaborations, the so collaborations between academics and government agencies, um, NGOs. So we need collaborations also with industries, the so collaborations which go beyond the sector. And I think COVID has taught us a lot, very hard lessons, but COVID also provides us an opportunity now, a pathway for green recovery with sustainable and resilient infrastructure. So thank you very much. I'm going to stop here. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you, Dr. Parrot. And uh, very, uh, very interesting talk. Thank you. Okay, because uh, all the discussion will be at the, at the end of this session. So please come back uh, at the end. Okay, thank you, Dr. Perry. Thank you. Bye. Uh, so the, ne the second keynote speaker is uh, Professor Lai Wang from 